Okay. All right, so we have begun the meeting. Mm -hmm. All right, well, welcome everyone to the Rideau Lakes Horticultural Society fifth uh, virtual meeting. Um, tonight we have Heather Mitchell Adams of Modern Times Health and Bulk Foods in Smith Falls, and she will discuss species of what we commonly think of as weeds and wildflowers that are native to our area, as well as species that have been introduced to our area for ornamental purposes. She will also note what benefits in addition to food value that you can get from vegetables you may be growing in your garden. Heather graduated from Dominion Herbal College as a chartered herbalist in 2003. Since graduation, she has continued to study herbal medicine and aromatherapy and is currently working towards accreditation as a nutritionist. As well as owning and operating the Smith's Falls store, Heather offers personal wellness consultations and enjoys with her family the green gifts from their Smith's Falls acreage. So Heather, it's all yours. All right. So thanks everybody for joining us this evening. And I, I hope um, I can give you some food for thought and maybe a couple aha moments that would be cool. Um, and uh, then we'll, um, I'll try and take some questions at the end if we have time. And <laughs> hopefully I, uh, I can navigate through, I've never um, been the presenter in a Zoom meeting before. So hopefully we don't, I don't hit too many hitches here. So we're going to start off with a disclaimer um, because as I am a herbalist, which is technically giving um, medical advice and suggestion, um, I need to offer this in the beginning. So be sure that you know what you are harvesting. Some plants can be easily mistaken for others, particularly when it's your first time foraging. Also, when deliberately planting some varieties for medicinal purposes, um, use the taxonomy for the name of the plant, not just the common name. They, uh, you can have, they can vary quite often by region, and then some plants, plants will have the same name as others depending on the area that you're in. <clears throat> the information I'm offering today is for educational purposes only and is not to be taken as a substitute for personal medical advice. Always make sure to consult your healthcare practitioner when diagnosing a health concern and let them know any alternative treatment you may be considering or practicing already. As a chartered herbalist, I can give wellness consultations and offer suggestions based on information that you give me. What you do with those suggestions is your prerogative. You have the right to advocate for your own health and make decisions that best suit your personal situation. So with that out of the way, let's begin. So these, um, we'll first go into some common weeds or what are um, taken as common weeds and underappreciated plants that you may have in your backyard right now or in your area around you. So the first one um, I'm sure most of you are probably familiar with is catnip or catmint. It's the uh, taxonomy for that is Nepeta cataria. The main properties of it are diaphoretic. It's an antispasmodic, a nervine, and a relaxant, which um, I'm sure if you've ever seen a cat using it, <laughs> um, you'll notice some of those things happening in a cat. It, uh, it does have quite a few different um, effects on humans, of course. It uh, generally grows in wild places like railroad tracks and roadside ditches. Um, you can cut and harvest it when it's in bud and dry. It's also considered a diaphoretic, which is um, uh, the best way to describe that is that it can actually bring on a bit of a fever. It's like a mild controlled fever, so it gives a little bit of a jump start to the immune system so that if you're starting to come down with something, it can help fight it off a little bit faster. Um, it's good particularly for colic and fevers. It has been used also historically for those with recurring bouts of pneumonia. You end up with um, scar tissue on the lungs and a regular either syrup of catnip or a, taken as an infusion um, or what's called a tea um, could also just be taken quite easily like that once a day to help uh, repair some of the scar tissue. Um, just a note, when we say tea in terms of herbal teas, it's actually um, like a short term for tisane, which is the French term for the infusion. So when we're talking about tea normally, um, that's the actual tea plant. Um, but then when we talk about herbal teas, it is technically a short form. So 
any of the herbal varieties, herbal teas, don't actually have any caffeine in them whatsoever. I know that's something that comes up sometimes. So I thought I'd just make that distinction right there. And then we're on to another one that um, it, it can be a little bit problematic because it's it grows quite large as you'll notice in the picture. So at the top there, I have a picture of it when it's coming, just coming in, it's quite flat to the ground. And then when it starts to get um, to full size, then it is, it's quite tall. It can be six feet or more. And it can be quite hard to pull out because the, uh, it's a tap root as well. So this is mulin or verbascum thapsis. It's an antibacterial and anti-inflammatory. It's used in a, as an expectorant and decongestant. And it's also an antispasmodic in terms of cough and re upper respiratory infection. It's generally wild pollinated, but it can be propagated. It's considered a biennial. So if you um, collect any of the seeds, you won't see it the first year. You'll see it the second. And then after that, um, people generally, there's two camps about this that some people will, they swear by collecting the leaves on the first season and others wait until the second season because they're quite a bit larger. So you obviously get more plant for your picking. Um, the whole plant can be harvested. Uh, you can pull the whole thing up out of the ground when it's in flower. Um, or like I said, you can leave it to have one more year's growth and just kind of cut a few leaves off or collect some of the seeds. You might want to use gloves when harvesting this one. Um, some people are sensitive to the, the hairs on it. If I don't, the pictures aren't super great, but if you'll notice, they are a bit fuzzy um, they are, and they feel quite soft, actually almost like a lamb's ear. So they're, um, they're quite good for upper respiratory infections, um, any pulmonary complaints and uh, bowel problems also. It can be used internally or externally. So if you're having, um, is as the anti-inflammatory properties that it has to it, um, some people will actually just bruise the leaves and put it over a wound or an insect bite. That's quite helpful as well. You can uh, boil the leaves down and make them into a lotion or salve for any inflammation and to aid the healing of any superficial wounds. If you macerate the leaves, it makes quite an excellent earache reliever when you're dealing with impacted earwax. It will loosen it up and help to dissolve it a little bit so that you can get it out more easily if you're dealing with a lot of pressure in your ears regularly. Some people just make more earwax than others and then it can get quite painful at times. So that's a that's a good one to have on hand. So you'd want to macerate it in oil somewhere dark and cool for at least a month. Um, six to eight weeks is even better. And then you just strain it off and then keep the oil somewhere dark and cool in an airtight container. So this one is also um, a bit of a pain for some people because it's a rhizome. So it'll creep along the ground as the name suggests, Creeping Charlie, also known as ground ivy and ale hoof. So this is, um, this is a good example of one that is Creeping Charlie is, there's a couple plants that are named for, are named Creeping Charlie. So you have to be um, careful with this one as well. It goes by Glaucomia heteracea. The main properties are that it is diuretic, tonic, and antispasmodic. This is another good one for um, summer colds and cough. So it propagates by rhizome, as I said, so it can be very invasive. You want to wait, if you're going to use this at all, you want to wait to harvest it when it's in flower. You'll see the little purple flowers that it gets on it. They're quite, um, they're quite cute, actually. And that second picture that's there, um, they're actually climbing up a wall. It's a drying and draining herb, um, considered drying and draining, for the mucosa of the ear, nose, and throat. Therefore, an infusion of this is quite soothing for dry coughs from like post-nasal drip. And it's also useful in the early stages of ear infection and sinus infection. So you can, um, again, not quite for the impacted earwax sort of thing that the mulin would be, but more so for something like a swimmer's ear or if you are getting, uh, if you feel pressure in your ears from having a sinus infection, that would be the early stages of an ear infection due to cough or flu or cold or flu. And it's also quite useful for superficial, as a superficial poultice for um, tumors at the surface of the skin and gathering sores as well. So this one um, may be familiar because um, it's a thyme, common thyme, or wild thyme as well, or otherwise known as creeping thyme. 
Um, it's a very good antiseptic and also another one that's a good expectorant. So these ones are good for people with asthma type conditions. Um, also uh, antiseptic. The infusion of this is very effective for whooping cough and asthma. It can be given freely at all ages. Um, externally, can, you can use it as a salve um, for sore muscles and rheumatism. And again, you would want to um, use it as a maceration uh, where you're leaving it in oil for in a cool, dark place for some time before you're um, using it. It is also sold sometimes as thymol, T-H-Y-M-O-L, which is an, uh, is an essential oil or extract. This is very effective, but can be toxic in large doses. The whole herb, when you're using the whole herb, not just the extract, it, can, it has no contraindications and um, can be given, as I said, freely at all age groups. Um, when you're extracting things down or um, getting specifics with um, essential oils, you have to be very careful because it's, it's very easy for you to overdose on it. Um, the, whole, the point of using the whole herb is that there are other chemical constituents within the plant that aid its effectiveness and absorption within your body and also so that you're not becoming um, desensitized to it as well. That is the way um, particularly adaptogenic herbs tend to work. Um, they, uh, they have particular parts of them that make it easier for your body to use them without you developing um, too many, oh, there's somebody else trying to enter here, um, without you having too much of a good thing. I know um, on, a, I think it was an episode of Fraser. he said, well, if, if less is more, think how much more and more will be. Well, it can be an awful lot more and sometimes it's a little too much more. So here's one that um, most of you will, I'm sure, will be familiar with and have been told to steer clear of quite often, which is a nettle or stinging nettle. So this one goes by the taxonomy of Utica diocea. Um, it is a source of iron, protein, and vitamin K. Indeed, during the Second World War, when it was becoming difficult to get enough um, raw green material to make silage for the livestock, they would sometimes use stinging nettle because when it was broken down, it was quite, um, it was quite nutritious, especially in silage for, for livestock, but for humans, it's particularly nutritious as well. It's an anti-inflammatory and natural analgesic and a source of irony. Because think of when you grab stinging nettle, when it's um, not when it's young, when it's full grown, it is definitely, it causing inflammation and causing some pain, but the chemical properties of it are anti-inflammatory and naturally analgesic, which is a pain reliever as well. So this one is easiest to harvest when young, obviously. It will have um, all of the particular nutrients available in it when it's young. Uh, it can be eaten fresh when young. The barbs haven't formed yet, and even when they have, they're quite soft. It can be pulled up completely when it's mature. Um, so if you want to thin it in an area where it comes up quite prolifically, that would be a good idea. And then you strip the leaves for fresh use or you can hang it up dry for storage. The mature plants can be wilted and cooked um, and just eaten as you would spinach. It, uh, it, the root itself offers help for enlarged prostate, which is some of those anti-inflammatory properties that we talked about. Um, it can be taken as an extract this way or as a tea. Um, with, when we're talking about roots, you generally, the tea that you would make from the roots is considered a decoction because the parts of the plant that are bark or roots are particularly fibrous. So instead of pour, pouring boiling water over them, as you would with most of the aerial parts and leaves, you want to start in a pan of cold water and bring it up to a boil. And then depending on the plant, you would want to boil it for between 10 and 20 minutes. Um, that will really break down those fibers and release some of those chemical constituents that you're after. So um, in terms of using it for enlarged prostate, 
uh, clinical trials that have been done with it over the years and historically um, notes from um, doctors' notebooks from years and years ago, we're talking like Victorian era. The, it can improve urine flow within only a few months of use when it's just used by itself even. Um, similarly to this, if you're not brave enough to go after nettle for some of the nutritional properties, we'll also be talking about lamb's quarters in a minute for similar use. And if anybody has uh, dogs, <laughs> you'll be familiar with the burdock as well, or the Arctium lapa or Arctium minus. It actually has anti-inflammatory properties as well. Quite a few of these do really, just depending on what part of the plant that you're using. The leaves also contain terpenes, which will actually um, activate our endocannabinoid system. The endocannabinoid system was called that because the first um, clinically documented like laboratory trials noticed that part of the brain being activated when it came in contact with cannabis. So there's actually a lot of plants that contain terpenes that will activate our cannabinoid system that are not cannabis at all. This would be one of them. And it, um, the leaves also contain inulin, which is a really um, great source of soluble fiber for our diet. And in Japan, it's actually propagated and the roots are eaten as a vegetable. This one is also self-seeding. Um, those little thistles on the top that um, in England, they're actually called teasels. That is where the seeds are contained. So they have that little purple flower for a very short amount of time. And then they go that brown color that you end up having come in on your dog's coat when he comes back home after a day out on running wild. Um, but as I said, those, those seeds can actually, they will self-seed, or as I said in Japan, it's actually propagated as a vegetable. The externally, the leaves and root are used for rashes and boils, pimples and eczema. And internally, you can also use the seeds for rheumat rheumatism, uh, dropsy, urinary tract infection, bladder infection, different kidney issues. And if you're having bouts of gout, it's particularly um, soothing on the, to the joints as well. So here's a pretty one, um, the marigold or pot marigold, Calendula officinalis specifically. Now this one is not to be confused with double marigold or the Tajetes varieties, which are the more decorative um, varieties of annuals that are also called marigold. So this one is anti-inflammatory, antibacterial, and antispasmodic as well. The flower part is the only part that's used on this. Um, it can be used as a preventative treatment for infection in issues from minor burns to sunburns, insect bites and stings, sore and pustular spots, acne, cuts, abrasions, inflama inflamed rashes, um, even hemorrhoids and varicose veins as well. It has some um, properties to it that are similar to witch hazel. It's very soothing for most skin complaints. So the easiest way to use this one is to start out by, again, making a maceration in oil of just the petals. And then after you have that, you can use it in a number of different ways. You can make it into a lotion or a salve, or you can make it into creams, or you can add it um, as a bath oil, or you can just use it by itself directly on, directly on the skin. It can also actually be taken as an infusion or tincture. Um, tinctures are generally made with alcohol or glycerin in the same way that the macerations are made. You're just changing the type of medium that it's in so you're able to extract different properties. Um, when it's taken as an infusion or tincture, it's great for stomach disorders and ulcers. Also for very painful periods or dysmenorrhea as well. You'd want to be taking it on a regular basis if you're taking it for particularly painful periods um, and then that way you're using it as a preventative. And another pretty one, uh, most people like to have this one in their garden. Um, particularly difficult to get seeds this year for whatever reason. Um, I guess a lot of people were gardening this year, everybody was a bit of a homesteader this year which was kind of nice. So this one is antibiotic the nasturtium, the Tripolium mygis. Um, and it's a natural antibiotic. It is a blood purifier, also known as an alterative. 
an antimicrobial and a, an expectorant as well. The whole plant is edible, including the seeds, which um, can be kept and made into poor man's capers by just putting them in vinegar and leaving them to sit. The flowers are particularly delicious. They're like a peppery um, sort of flavor and they're a nice addition to any salad and they will also aid in your digestion which with, with whichever meal you're eating it with. The leaves are generally used externally on wounds to prevent infection. You can bruise them and place them directly on the wound um, like a poultice. Um, and the infusion of the leaves can be used as a gargle for sore throats as well. Um, so generally when you're doing an infusion, I think I, I went over this briefly before. If you're using an infusion, which is adding boiling water to the leaves and aerial parts of the plant, like the flowers, you don't want to use water that is still at a rolling boil. You want to have left it for a couple minutes after it is come to a boil and then pour it over top and leave it for anywhere between five and 15 minutes, depending on the plant. And then we move on to plantain. Um, not the banana looking one that you can get and fry up, but Plantago major, Plantago lanceolata, and Plantago psyllium, which is where we get our psyllium seed husks from for fiber. It's an anti-inflammatory. It's a cooling alternative, so that means it has an effect on the blood. It's an emollient and diuretic, meaning that it will help with uh, water retention. It's also a mucilaginous. That would be mostly the seeds. So when used as a fiber source, the seeds are the, you, not just the fiber that you're getting out of it, but the, mus the mucilage that you're getting from it is particularly soothing to the digestive tract. So if you're having any sort of digestive complaints like IBS or IBD, um, this is one of the easiest fiber sources to add into your diet because it's not irritating. Um, it can be bruised and put, like just the leaves, can be bruised and put directly on skin irritations. Um, if you've ever noticed, plantain usually grows particularly close to nettle most of the times. And you'll find that with quite a few plants that um, it's an old wives tale, but it ends up bearing some truth to it that generally the plant that is going to hurt you, there's one nearby that will help you. Um, funny, well, interesting story, not funny story, I guess. When we were visiting family in England, my eldest daughter at the time was only about four years old and she fell hands first. She didn't get her face in it, but she fell hands first into a big patch of stinging nettle. And nearby, there was a nice, their plantain leaves over there grow really, really big and fat. Um, so I bruised up a couple of the leaves and she held them between the palms of her hands while we finished our walk and her hands went from a really um, angry looking red to just her normal little four-year-old hands within about five minutes or so. And the pain that she had was gone, which is nice because we weren't anywhere near um, a pharmacy where we could have picked up a cream or anything for her. So that was kind of nice. We were able to find something right nearby that she could use. Um, this is another one you can also macerate in oil as well. Um, it will actually pull toxins and venom out of the barbs of uh, venom and barbs out of the skin, which is how it works with the nettle. Um, this one here, I'm sure you've all noticed by roadsides. Um, it's sort of in the early spring, it looks a little bit like an anemic sort of asparagus, and it can be eaten as asparagus, just fresh. But then later on, it has these little hairs that come out from the sides. This is horsetail or Echocetum arvens. It's an astringent. It contains quite a, a large amount of silica, phosphorus, iron, manganese, saponins, phytosterols, which is particularly good for uh, cholesterol. It's um, used traditionally to stop bleeding and ulcers and wounds and treat. It has been historically used to treat tuberculosis and kidney problems as well. It likes damp, shady areas and roadsides. Um, it can be taken as a tea or juice for hair, skin, and nail remedies. It has some astringent properties that make it excellent for prostate support as well. Um, that would be mostly when you're eating it fresh. Um, you can have it as a tea as well, but you'll get, um, you'll get a little bit less out of it that way. Um, it has been used traditionally to stop bleeding and ulcers, as I said. 
you can't use the whole herb for more than two months at a time. This is another one where you can kind of get a little bit too much of a good thing. So you can have it for two months straight as a, as a remedy or eating it fresh. And then you would want to back off of it for a week or two before you start taking it again. And this is one that there has been an all out warfare about to rip it up wherever we see it. This purple loose stripe is a particularly invasive plant um, in our area, especially. And we notice it um, most places in uh, any damp, loose draining uh, soil, like in ditches and near marshes. Um, it has a surprising amount of really beneficial properties to it, though, as you'll see. It's alternative, antispasmodic, diuretic, astringent, and antifebrage or antipyretic, meaning that it can help bring down um, extended fevers. It's a tonic and demulsant and anti-inflammatory and antibacterial and a hemostatic, which is especially good for people who are, have conditions like hemophilia. Um, as I said, it's quite invasive. So, I mean, if you want to use it for a remedy, I'm, you, you're not going to have anybody stopping you from pulling up the entire plant. Um, historically, it has been used for cholera specifically. It was introduced, um, it can be introduced at any stage of the disease with great effect. It's promoting um, diaphoresis or it fever. So when you're getting to the point where you're trying to break the fever, that's when you can, um, that's a particularly good part of the stage of the disease to introduce it. It will also normalize bile secretion, kidney and bladder are supported, and the spasmodic cramping that usually happens in cholera is allayed so that the patient can actually get some rest. Um, it's useful for fevers, constipations, hepatic troubles um, like cold sores and cankers, dysentery, hemorrhaging, uh, leucorrhea, which is a passive bleeding in women. Uh, superficial wounds, sores, and ulcers, and also, also useful as preventative for eyesight and clouded vision because it contains some vitamin A. And this one, we're looking more at the garden now. So the main properties of fennel, um, and we're talking particularly about the seeds here, are that it's a digestive, a galactagogue, that's a big word. <laughs> I always stumble over that one, actually. I'm surprised I got that one out. It means that it will help promote help promote breast milk in women. Um, it's a mild appetite suppressant as well and a phytoestrogen also. Um, so in the Mediterranean, this is generally the bulb will be eaten um, as part of a salad at the end of a meal because it helps to, to help digest the meal and keep you from overeating. But the part that you it has the most medicinal properties would be the seeds. So if you let a bulb go to seed, you get quite a lot of seeds off of it. And that's where you're going to get that galactagogue properties from it and the phytoestrogenic properties as well. Um, just looking through my notes here. Um, it is, as a tea, it is also really helpful, um, the, t the seeds that is. It's also particularly helpful for menstrual pain and disorders because of these, um, the estrogen promoting properties. And then moving on, we're going to take a closer look at your veg garden and flower beds. So these will typically be things that you're planting on purpose. So when we're looking at tomatoes, it's just about the time uh, some people might even have some cherry tomatoes coming out already. Um, and we know they're good for us, but this is particularly what we're getting from them is vitamin C, K1, potassium, folate, and lycopene. Now, Lycopene, I find particularly interesting in tomatoes, especially because you get quite a lot of lycopene from a raw tomato, but when you cook it, you get 180 times more lycopene from a tomato, especially if you're cooking it down into something like a tomato paste. One of the really cool things that happens when you do that is because you're actually increasing your skin's natural SPF factor. Um, so that brings me to I get what I like to call the ketchup theory. Have you ever wondered why young children don't usually get a sunburn? They eat an awful lot more ketchup than most adults do. So, and ketchup is mainly tomato paste, which is cooked down tomatoes. So whether that is entirely scientifically accurate or not. I'm just looking at that. That's, there's more correlation than causation there, but I just think that's 
a really cool way to look at it. They've actually done tests in Ireland with particularly fair-skinned people and over a two-week period of them eating two tablespoons of um, tomato paste a day, they had noticed uh, quite a significant increase in their, their body's natural SPF factor without them adding any additional sunscreen to their skin. So it's uh, lycopene is also, it's also used with great success by holistic and traditional Western medicine for a number of different things um, besides increasing your natural SPF. It's also being used regularly for prostate health, for lung and, lung and respiratory health, and it will reduce your risk of heart disease and some cancers as well. So here's what I mentioned earlier. This is lambs, quarters, or fat hens. This will grow anywhere where the soil has been disturbed. So if you've got a disturbed garden at all, I'm sure you've noticed these popping up um, before any of your, your actually planted plants have managed to um, poke up at all. Um, they're actually, use them. I mean, take advantage of the fact that they're in there. You're going to want to pull them out of your garden anyway. They're a source of vitamin A, vitamin C. Um, you get all of your B vitamins except for 12 potassium, copper, manganese, and you get some fiber out of it too per 100 gram serving, you get four grams of fiber out of that. So don't dismiss um, their taste or nutritional value. They're excellent added into any salad. Um, historically, this was relied on to give nutritional boost during what was termed the hunger gap. So that would be like between February and May when you would start to see the first um, vegetables coming out of the garden. It helps to jumpstart a sluggish digestion from uh, large amounts of preserved and heavily salted foods from winter storage. So they help to prepare your system for all of the fresh food that's about to be consumed and it can also help with gout that usually occurs from the amount of preserved and salted foods using during winter storage as well. Another one that was typically used was called tansy. Um, the only problem with using that is that it's very difficult to make sure you're getting the right amount of that without it being toxic. So this, you'd get the same sort of effect without having to worry about um, kind of overdoing it. So here's one that's a little, I mean, we're looking at carrots in general, um, but particularly wild carrots. So this one's a bit, um, it's a tricky one. It's a bit of a tricky one because Queen Anne's lace can often look a little bit like other things that we're trying to avoid out there that um, can be um, quite inflaming to our skin. Um, so mainly concerning the greens, it is uh, they are diuretic. Um, the root is also, sort of, of course, a source of vitamin A. Um, but this one, as I said, is a bit tricky. So identification is critical for this one. It can be easily confused with more toxic cousins and some are allergic or sensitive to the variety, um, the Queen Anne slice variety as well. You can add the greens to salads or juice them as a diuretic. Um, the, um, the greens of the Hamburg or root parsley can also be used similarly if you don't want to worry about um, mistaking this for something else. So another one that we usually find in our all right, so red clover or trifolium pretens, or as my children call it, uh, nectar. They just call it nectar because they take the little florets off and will chew on the ends to get the, the, the sweetness inside. This is an alternative, meaning it has an effect on the blood, of uh, blood purification specifically. So if you're dealing with hives or um, allergic reactions, or if you have sensitivities to certain foods, this can help to um, move them through your blood and cycle them out of your body a little bit faster. It's mildly stimulating and it's a phytoestrogen as well. So as a phytoestrogen, it can be used with good effect for menopause symptoms and dysmenorrhea. When it's combined with a red raspberry leaf in a tea to aid fertility in both men and women. Now the phytoestrogenic effect that it has on it can help with menopausal symptoms, um, particularly for most women, it's mainly for um, uh, night sweats and um, hot flashes, but it, depending on the person, it will work on different, um, different symptoms as well. And here's the red raspberry leaf that we talked about. So the main properties of this is that it is, is stringent to the tissues. It's an alternative, so having effect on the blood as well, a stimulant and a tonic. So the tonic is specific to the reproductive organs, particularly in women. 
when taken throughout pregnancy, it will aid labor and make the contractions more effective. Um, also during postpartum, it can help shorten the convalescence, particularly when taken in conjunction with nettle. It can be very helpful to shorten the postpartum bleeding. Um, typically, most public health nurses will send someone to me to get red raspberry leaf at the store when they're within a few weeks of their due date or even right before their due date if they're worried about them being overdue. But it really is more helpful if the woman's taking it throughout the pregnancy because then when labor comes on, the contractions are much more effective. And here's another one that has a similar name to another plant that we don't want to confuse it with because it'll have totally different properties. This is the Cranesville geranium or the geranium mac maculatum. Um, the one that we normally have in our gardens is called, uh, they're called pelargonium and they're not the true geranium, which is the other name for this one. It is astringent, tonic, and styptic for its properties. It can be easily substituted in situations where witch hazel is useful but can't be obtained. And it's also a bit stronger, but the effect is not as drying as witch hazel can be. Um, the, where it says um, styptic, the difference between styptic and hemostatic Styptic is causing the formation of blood clot by chemical action. Um, a vascular styptic checks bleeding by causing the blood vessels to contract. So that makes this particularly good for conditions such as varicose veins and hemorrhoids where you're having pooling of blood and the, the tissues of the veins have gone lax. It can help to um, tone them up again so that you'll have more uh, blood flow more easily. And the last one we have listed here is quite familiar to most people. So there's actually two varieties of echinacea and they do have different, um, they do have different properties and different uses. So echinacea purpurea versus echinacea angustifolia and they both look almost exactly the same. So this is one that you would really want to make sure that if you're going to plant it for use, not just for looks, you want to know which one you're using by taxonomy, not just by the name. It also goes by purple cone flower quite often. So Echinacea purpurea is a preventative. You get more immune support from this. So you, if you're someone who is more susceptible to cold and flu, or you're just trying to bolster yourself before cold and flu season, you'd be taking it before you're ill. Echinacea angustifolia is regularly used for cold and flu treatment and will shorten the duration. Um, it's also quite often paired with elderberry. Um, it, when given during a flu, a reg during a regular flu, the, the effect is quite pronounced. It'll have uh, some diaphoretic effect, meaning that it'll bring on a slight controlled fever to, um, it ends up sort of giving a jump start to your immune response to the colder flu. So that's how it shortens the, the duration. But again, another one that's really pretty to have in the garden, but if you're using it for something specific, you want to make sure you know which one you have. <clears throat> and if you're going to have both varieties in your garden, make sure that you've got them well separated because as I said, they are almost identical looking plants. So you want to make sure you know which one you're, which one you're pulling up to use for what. And that is all I have so far. So if there's anything there that you um, have in your own garden, I'd love to hear about it. Or if you have questions about it, feel free. Um, you'd, you'd be surprised what, uh, what uses you can get out of your yard if you wander around and see some of this stuff. Well, thank you so much, Heather. Um, we will put this video up on YouTube and I will send a message out to our Facebook group to see if anyone has any questions there. Um, we can also open up, uh, I have comments enabled on YouTube, uh, they're moderated, so we can do it that way as well. And I'll send an email to our um, email list uh, to see if anyone has any questions through that because we are out of time today. Uh, but thank you very much. We really appreciate you uh, doing this presentation for us. Thanks. I had fun putting it together. I, I love talking about this stuff. I always find it uh, 
I don't know, it's always surprising what you'll find in your yard. Absolutely, and most of these are really common. We're just used to seeing them all over the place, so it's, it's good that this is recorded for future reference. So again, thank you very much, and uh, we will see you all very soon. Thanks so much.